You have defeated me. This time. <laughs> In February of 1993, Lawrence Holland's space flight simulator transformed the top-down and side-scrolling efforts of the Rebel Alliance into a perspective fans could easily recognize, the interior of an X-Wing. As revolutionary as the 3D engine and IMU score were at the time, they ran off a prehistoric floppy disk format that would soon bow out of the industry. LucasArts published its first Star Wars game on CD-ROM eight months later, adding voice acting and a compressed but authentic version of the John Williams score. Rebel Assault followed a young trainee known only as Rookie One. The ambiguous name allowed players to choose the pilot's gender, and his or her voice changed accordingly. After making the grade on the training grounds of Tatooine, the missions followed Blue Squadron as they engaged a Star Destroyer and protected Mos Eisley from an Imperial attack. Throwing cannon out the window, Rookie One disabled an AT-AT on Hoth before the Rebellion even got there, and took over Luke's responsibility of destroying the Death Star. Han Solo's last-minute cover was instead fired by Rookie One's instructor, Commander Jake Farrell. Farrell's appearance was modeled after an A-Wing pilot who flew alongside Lando in the Battle of Endor. While Rebel Assault presented the blocky illusion of being airborne, the levels were actually full-motion video of pre-rendered environments. Stuck traveling in a predetermined direction, pilots could shift slightly to avoid obstacles like asteroids and canyon walls. The initial difficulty could be lightened by repeating each stage and memorizing the location of enemy ships. Most would judge it as being blurry and boring by today's standards, but sales were strong enough to warrant three ports on the Mac, Sega CD, and Panasonic 3DO. Years later, Rebel Assault revisited the PC in a sequel dubbed The Hidden Empire. It again starred Alliance hero Rookie One, whose gender was predetermined by actor Jameson Jones. Pilot trainer Rue Merlin also returned from the first game and was portrayed by Julie Eccles, who supplied the voice for Jan Ors in Dark Forces. They starred in live action cutscenes that told a brand new story instead of rewriting more of the classic trilogy. Splendid flying, Rookie One. You do the Emperor proud. Merlin and Rookie One were sent to investigate reports of Imperial ghost ships that attacked out of nowhere. The two discovered these new TIE Phantoms were being manufactured at a mining facility shielded by an asteroid field. Disguised as stormtroopers, they infiltrated the Starship Terror, exposed the factory, and escaped with one of the Phantom models. But a self-destruct system kept the Alliance from learning the Empire's secrets. Rebel Assault 1 and 2 gave fans a guided tour through Star Wars space clashes, even if they bent the truth a bit to do so. Rookie 1's anonymity was presumably included to give the player a sense that they had joined the Rebellion themselves, rather than controlling a celebrity character from the movies. We all know it was Red 5 and not Rookie 1 that won the Battle of Yavin, and the Empire's cloaking exercises somehow never got back on track.
In actuality, the bulk of the anti-Empire operations in space following Episode 4 were conducted by an elite crew founded by Luke Skywalker and Wedge Antilles. They named the team Rogue Squadron, and this Alliance Defense Force went on to protect Echo Base, demolish the Death Star 2, and eventually liberate the planet city of Coruscant. The group starred in a series of novels started by Michael Stackpole, a comic line published by Dark Horse, and three self-titled video games for the Nintendo 64, PC, and GameCube. The first Rogue Squadron was released on December 7, 1998. It was developed by Factor 5, who had previously worked on R-Type, the Turrican series, and Indiana Jones' Greatest Adventures. The first assignment led Skywalker back to the sandy surface of Tatooine, picking up days after the Battle of Yavin and the conclusion of Episode 4. His A-team of ace pilots included Wes Jansen, Derek Hobby Clivian, Zev Seneska, and Dak Ralter, who eventually died during the Battle of Hoth. During a skirmish on Gerard IV, Imperial pilot Kaysen Moore also defected to the Alliance forces. Craft selection, which varied each level, included an X-Wing, A-Wing, Y-Wing, V-Wing, and a speeder. Fourteen story missions followed the rogues in pursuit of the Imperial moth Cole Searden. The young squadron honed their skills on the surfaces of Barkesh to escort a rebel convoy, the Jade Moon to protect defecting General Crix Maydeen, Kessel to rescue Wedge from a moving train, Han Solo's hometown of Corellia, and Talaran, Fest, and Balmora to disrupt an Imperial mining operation, weapons facility, and construction yard. Mon Calamari, the last of the 13 planets and Admiral Akbar's home, fell under siege from Imperial devastators, six years after the Battle of Endor. Cheats and achievements opened up several additional planets and ships. Luke could take a skyhopper run through Beggar's Canyon, navigate a multi-directional Death Star Trench, and bring the big walkers down trekking the fields of Hoth. Typing the password CHICKEN unlocked a grassy playground for an ATST, and the right codes also made the TIE Interceptor, Black Buick, and the Millennium Falcon permissible for flight. Factor 5 even preemptively coded in the N1 Starfighter five months before Episode 1 reached theaters. Once the movie was released, the codes to unlock the hidden ship were announced. Rogue Squadron received the Origins Award for the best action computer game in 1999, and garnered average to excellent reviews. It was considered a worthy shooter for the PC, but Factor 5's work on the Nintendo 64 was given special credit for producing surprisingly smooth results from an action flight game with a two-year-old console. Its expansion of popular events between the classic episodes also generated an affectionate nostalgia from fans. Nintendo, longtime supporters of the load-friendly cartridge format, finally released an optical, disc-based cube of a console in Japan and North America in 2001. Rogue Squadron 2 was one of a handful of its launch games. The sequel deployed new tactics, unlockable content, and familiar adventures from the comics and novels of the 80s. Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader was released with a Nintendo GameCube on November 18th, and set a new benchmark for what a Star Wars video game could look like. Following a less linear mission structure, the campaign in Rogue Leader bounced around in and out of the classic trilogy. After more Tatooine training, Luke warped to the Death Star surface against chains of fighters and towers. After an ambush in the Ison Corridor, you fought the hopeless Battle of Hoth, 
retrieved the Emperor's plans on and above Cothlis, stole the shuttle Tidarium used in the infiltration of the Forest Moon, and survived all three Death Star 2 stages, the Approach, the Shell, and the Interior. Other operations included gas smuggling on Bespin and a prison rescue during the Battle of the Maw. Rogue Leader broke through the atmosphere and offered the first space missions in the series. Since the title alluded to Wedge and Luke's superior position, four commands could be issued to your squad mates via the directional pad, and they changed depending on each outing. Pilots tired of one ship could now swap to another in flight to take on evolving challenges. To diversify its loading bay, the sequel added the B-Wing, along with the unlockable Lambda-class shuttle, Slave-1, TIE Fighter, TIE Advanced, and Bespin Cloud Car. Like the first game, several bonus missions grew out of the events in the campaign, letting you pilot the TIE Defense turret on the Millennium Falcon and dodge and weave Han's pride and joy through the treacherous asteroid field. Even plot-altering expeditions could be opened up, such as opportunities for Vader to defend the first Death Star and seek revenge on Yavin 4 after the Rebel victory. Rogue Squadron 2 was edged out by Luigi's Mansion for the best-selling GameCube launch title. It won the E3 2001 Game Critics Award for Best Action Game and was the seventh best-selling game the month it was released. Rogue Leader is one of the few Star Wars games to include genuine live-action scenes pulled straight from the movies. Also, Dennis Lawson, the actor who starred as Wedge in Episodes 4, 5, and 6, added authenticity by recording his character's voice in the game. The in-game visuals were so incredible for their time that many questioned if early screenshots were doctored. Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike was released on October 15, 2003, and was also exclusive to the GameCube. Mirroring the mission line from Rogue Leader, Rebel Strike's campaign started with a destroyed Death Star and an alliance desperate for a new home. The journey explored the Battle of Hoth, again, along with the last vehicular remnants in the old trilogy, the escape from Yavin 4, the Pit of Carcoon, the speeder bike chase, and the destruction of the shield generator on Endor. While fleeing the Empire, the rogues picked up new allies on Dantooine and Raltir, followed by a rescue on Bakara, return to Geonosis, Imperial entanglements in Dubrillion, and the construction site of an experimental Star Destroyer on Fondor. Factor 5 let pilots leave the cockpit, swap cannons for blasters, and jog around, albeit with varied success. This third-person view made the rescue of Princess Leia, evacuation of Echo Base, and the Boba Fett chase through Bespin possible in 3D for the first time. An extra Endor flight mission picked up where Rogue Leader left off, with you as the brave A-Wing pilot that took the Executor head-on. Literally. Fans that were exhausted with single-player Rogue Squadron could finally test their dexterity in several versus and cooperative multiplayer options. Dogfight pitted pilot against pilot, and Rampage gave the medal to whoever destroyed the most targets. Racing was as simple as it sounds, while tag and defend was a complicated gamble of building defenses. Best of all, almost the entire campaign from Rogue Leader was playable with another Rogue plugged into port 2. Though a robust package, the overall product felt rushed and Rebel Strike fell on the wrong side with critics.
X-Wing was released in 1993, five years before Rogue Squadron, and delivered endless space flight hours for aspiring pilots to add to their resume. No franchise went deeper into the working gears of Rebel and Imperial flight helmets. Rogue Squadron not only took a slice of that experience across mountains, canyons, oceans, and forests, it remarkably found unchecked pockets of the later episodes. Whether they required a password, gold medal, or unlockable ship, the trials of Rogue Squadron gave some of the lesser-known Alliance war heroes their chance to stick it to the Empire. Episode 10 will conclude the retrospective by giving every last game its due, from forgettable fighters to crash and kill combat. We'll connect the vast library of titles by publishers, developers, actors, or gamers, and look at the future of LucasArts that isn't so far, far away.